So I am here once again with the the immortal John Linneman, who uh, who has probably been a guide for anybody who's wanted to buy a, the right version of a video game in the past few years. How's it going, John? Uh, it's going pretty good, Bob. Good to be here again on this lazy Saturday afternoon. So yeah, usually on the weekends, I'm so deep in whatever video I'm trying to release for Monday. I just I don't even you know I just I don't even have time to do anything. And now I'm in the middle of three videos, none of which I could finish because parts are stuck in shipping somewhere. So <laughs> figured yeah, uh, good I opportunity know. to have a chat with you today. Yeah, of course. So. Um, when I spoke to you last, I, I knew who you were and I knew who Digital Foundry was, but you, you all put out a lot of videos, a lot of great videos, but it, I didn't really grasp what DF Retro was until after that video when I went back and watched and really just searched for DF Retro only. Uh, and even though I was obviously a fan going into that interview anyway, I, I really gained a whole other appreciation for your work. Uh, and especially after the interview, too, because you gave a lot of like trade secrets away on how to make these videos, which also kind of cracks me up because it's like Michael Jordan explaining how to dunk. You can explain it all you want, but no one's really going to do it like you. <laughs> so so <laughs> thank you very much for all of that. Definitely wanted to start out with a, a giant thank you for everything. Wow. It's been a while since that video, hasn't it? Yeah. Over two Modern, years. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So interesting how time passes. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, as everybody probably realizes, we're doing this over the internet. So there's going to be delays and talking over. My apologies. I always much prefer doing these in person, but especially nowadays, there's just, that's not feasible. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. So the one, one of the things, kind of a, a neat thing for anybody that, that enjoys the weirdness of retro consoles that didn't do too well, um, like the 32X is a perfect example. Uh, one of the things that I thought you did so well in that 32X video is you gave everybody watching a feel for what it's like to play that console, but also what games are actually worth playing. So I thought it would be kind of fun if we just started out talking about some of the weird ones like 3DO, 32X, Philips CDI, oh, of course, yeah. and just say, is there any game on that <laughs> platform, on any of those platforms that that you think is worth playing versus anything else? And that's something that you and I have talked about personally a, a lot, but I don't think we've done it in front of the camera. Yeah, that's a good point. So which system do you want to start with? Well, 32X, because the video is out there and we could make it kind of quick. Um, there, it's a two part video. I highly recommend people watch it, sit down with a six pack and a, a thing of popcorn and just treat it like a movie. But uh, I guess let's start <laughs> with that one because you've already covered it in detail and we could kind of just skip to the end. Oh, yeah, that's always kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing about these systems is I really like to sort of find the good in them. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Where it's just like this chance to kind of explore the library, find out what's actually decent on there, because you know a lot of great systems have failed, and uh, the 32x is not great, but there are <laughs> some games in there. I mean, when you think about it, um, there's a lot of Sega's arcade heritage on here. Yes. So you have a really nice version of Virtua Racing with Virtua Racing Deluxe. Mm -hmm. It's very playable. It looks nice. It's still fun today. I think it holds up okay. I mean, a flat shaded polygon look works. It's got very decent versions of Afterburner and Space Harrier on there. Agreed. Which, again, good stuff. Uh, the port of Virtua Fighter, I think, is is excellent, uh, sp especially considering the time. In some ways, you know, it was arguably superior to the very glitchy Saturn release. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you consider the time period that game was released, then, yeah, it's, it's very impressive. Yeah, so that kind of stuff is big. I've really kind of come around on Chaotix uh, or Knuckles Chaotix. Mm -hmm. It's not a great game, but it's an interesting one, mm -hmm. and it's it's worth exploring, I think. The world is cool. But I also like, I think Tempo is a genuinely fun little platformer for the game that is really, or for the system, that has excellent visuals. And it even had a sequel on the Saturn, which is quite a lot of fun as well. You know, I haven't um, sat down and spent any time with that game, and now you're reminding me I really needed to do so. Um, I agree on all all other points, um, and the only other one that I thought was pretty cool was for um, NBA Jam. Uh, Genovi just did a pretty good uh, analysis of each version, but he forgot to uh, fire all of them up in an emulator and see what the frame rate was. Do you happen to remember? Was it uh, close to arcade frame rate, or was that you know a, a twenty frame per second port of the game? So uh, NBA Jam TE is perfectly solid on the 32X, and it does run at 60 frames per second, mm -hmm. as it should. 
Uh, and the same is true for Mortal Kombat 2, mm-hmm. which was another midway conversion. They also did WWF WrestleMania, the arcade game, which I'm a big fan of. But that one actually runs at 30 FPS for some reason. Um, but the thing about MK2 and NBA Jam is that they're they're very decent ports. They're solid ports even, but the amount of enhancements to them is minimal. Mm-hmm. Like it's they're they're just derived from the 16-bit console versions with uh, some slight changes to the color palette. Mm-hmm. They sort of move colors around, like especially in MK2, they kind of used slightly different colors for the background, and then all the characters are the backgrounds are still rendered by the Genesis, mm-hmm. uh, but the foreground is done or the the characters are done with the 32x, and I think it's the same with NBA Jam, where you have 32x character sprites, and sort of the background is still generated by the Genesis. So you know it's a kind of split kind of game, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, it's um it's still just one of those things where it's always trying to find a balance between not dealing with CD load times, dealing with, you know, the most fun experience. And of course, you know, I would love to have arcade boards for all of these, but that's just not reasonable to consider, you know. Yeah, and that's so the so, you know, those are totally cool. I mean, I think in terms of visual quality, the Saturn and PlayStation version of NBA Jam holds up better mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it has like insanely aggressive ai that actually makes it kind of uh not so fun to play yeah um another one other one i would throw out there i'm just looking i mean i would definitely say um stellar assault you know that one the yes. space shooter mm-hmm. from sega which also got a sequel on the saturn um that one is a lot of fun it's a really slick space shooter with surprisingly fluid polygon graphics uh it's that same flat shaded look kind of like Star Fox, but uh, it runs much 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 smoother and it's more detailed than that so it has a really good soundtrack it's a it's an interesting sort of japanese take on that genre mm-hmm. and i like that one a lot so i mean for me those are just some of the games that i actually think are genuinely good and kind of worth owning on the system mm-hmm. so you know so the the Sega arcade ports agree a hundred percent. Trophy you mentioned as well as what was the the um, that no 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 it was um, um, tempo 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 sorry tempo and then the game that you just mentioned the space shooter stellar stellar assault, assault. Yeah. and then um, I I always recommend that people check out Knuckles Chaotix and Colibri. I don't really like either oh, yeah. of those games personally, but I do think they're absolutely worth spending fifteen minutes with if you have the ability to. Also, it just occurred to me, Stellar Assault, I think, is the Japanese title for that game. Uh, it's Shadow Squadron in the U.S. That's why so I was drawing a just, blank. Just okay. for people that are confused <laughs> there. Because I was thinking of the sequel on Saturn, which is Stellar Assault SS, mm-hmm. and then there's Stellar Assault on 32X. But yeah, it's Shadow Squadron in the uh, in the U.S. at least. So one of the videos that I'm halfway through is a 32x video, and it's you know starts out just very basics. How does it work? Why does it? Why do you need all the extra cables? But I do show footage of two monitors side by side, one that's only showing the Genesis layer, and then one that's showing both. Um, and yeah. I think you could do this yourself with emulation. Um, and I don't think there's any way with physical hardware to do just a 32x layer. But I still thought that would be a pretty cool thing, even if I just even if it's a five minute video and then i leave you know seven or eight minutes of b-roll at the end just playing footage for people i think it's uh, it was really impressive for me to first realize how much of each game was drawn by either the genesis or the 32x yeah when i did those clips actually what i did to do it was obviously like you say you can't just pull i think it's the 32x visuals you can't just pull so what i did was i captured the output from the genesis side Mm -hmm for games that had like rolling demos for instance Mm -hmm. and i would just capture that and then i would go to an emulator and then capture the 32x portion only and then so at least when you pair it up you kind of have half real hardware and then half emulation uh it would be cool to actually extract the the 32x video output only using original hardware but I haven't found a way to do that. Yeah, me neither. I think emulation is the best way to accomplish it. And I always like to show off real hardware in my videos because I think that's kind of just become my thing. It's not necessarily something that I'm obsessed with, but I think people that watch my videos kind of enjoy that. So I'll, I'll just be doing the, the two RGB monitors next to each other just for the hell of it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So what what other systems should we get into? How about the uh, the Atari Jaguar? Yeah, absolutely. It's a controversial one. That's... um. 
The Jag is a weird system. Um, there's some good stuff on there. There's some really not so good stuff on there. Mm -hmm. It is very mixed. Um, let me think here. I'm going to start with, I think, actually what is genuinely the best game on the system. But unfortunately, it also has ports elsewhere, and that would be the original Rayman. Oh, yeah. Which I think is genuinely a great game. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, the Jaguar version is both better and worse in different ways. So visually, it's lacking some of the parallax layers. And honestly, I think the soundtrack is not great. Mm -hmm. like the Jaguar renditions of the music, I don't care for much. But the game itself is easier in the long term. And I'm, not to say that there's an issue with challenge, but in the original games, if I recall, you have to collect all these cages in every single stage. And they're kind of annoying to find in some stages. And that's the only way you can unlock the final area. Mm -hmm. So you, you had to go like go through these stages with a fine tooth comb to actually see the end. Whereas I think in the Jaguar version, uh, you don't have to do that. So it's, and there's also some changes to certain timings and stuff. So it's a little bit different. So it's kind of an interesting alternative version. Hmm. I mean, that was the one of the games that always caught my eye on the system. Um, the one that, that definitely stood out for me, and it surprised me, it was Tempest 2000. Um, and that was a game that uh, my cousin Scott had told me about it, and he said, but you got to try to do the spinner controller hack. At the time, years ago, I didn't even know what that was, so I contacted Nick Persain, who I believe you know as oh, yeah. well. And yeah, and he, uh, I bought a controller off of him, and I finally sat down and I played Tempest, and I just... I thought like a few minutes had gone by and I was like, oh, this is neat. I guess this really was worth all the trouble. And then I looked at my phone and it had been 45 minutes. So I'm just, I, I was surprised at how much I really loved the game. And it's the spinner yeah. controller for me that set it apart from everything else. So if the PlayStation version had a, a proper spinner, an infinite spin controller like you can with the Jaguar mod, I think I would be totally fine playing that. But playing with the new on controller, you know, or stuff like that, it just it's not the same for me. So um, you're right. I think Nick's work specifically on those spinner controllers is phenomenal. And for those who aren't familiar, he's basically modding Atari Jaguar pads in different ways. And this is what I love. He's putting the spinner dial. Uh, you can kind of customize it. Like I have one where it's replaced the D pad. So it's mm -hmm. only for Tempest. But then he also made one uh, for a friend of mine where he put the spinner on the back of the controller. Yep. So when you're holding it with your grip, you don't feel the spinner, your fingers, unless you have like insanely long fingers, I guess, but it's, yeah. it's out of the way. But then when you want to play Tempest, you flip it over and then you just kind of hold it like almost like you have like your your fingers here as like on the front buttons, almost like they're, uh, I guess, triggers. And then you use the back spinner. So it's it's a fun kind of way to do it. But actually at Jagfest. Oh, yeah, I go to I go to something called Jagfest. You know this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I say that so casually, like, yeah, you know, Jagfest. It's the Atari Jaguar Festival, and I'm not kidding. It's, it's a legit thing, and um, Nick is always there. And this year, he actually brought, uh, he made a, a large controller, like arcade stick style thing with a massive, uh, fully weighted dial. <laughs> I think the dial by itself was like a hundred bucks <laughs> on its own. So, I mean, this is like extremely premium dial action right here. And uh, he he actually connected it up to the um, the Nuon. Right, yeah. So he could play Tempest 3000 with this huge full metal dial. And it's just, it's nuts. I saw that. That was really <laughs> awesome. I, uh, I've i been bugging Nick to try to do similar mods for PlayStation. And I guess the Saturn version of Tempest as well. Uh, just to see if it's even possible. I don't even know if that would be, if there's a hidden modes in see, those games. That's the thing is... The Jaguar and Nuon versions were made by uh, Jeff Minter himself, right? Right. And he implemented code specifically to support these spinners. And I don't think he was involved in the other conversions. So it's entirely possible that that code just doesn't exist. Because, I mean, he implemented in two, these two games when they didn't natively have controllers like that, right? Right. Like they didn't exist mm -hmm. uh, on the market. So he just put it in there just in case. And it actually came in handy, so... Uh, I love that, but beyond that, uh, other Jaguar games. Actually, let me. Let me where, where's my Jaguar list here of the <laughs> stuff I own here? Uh, oh yeah, Super Burnout. That's a good one. Really? Are you familiar with that? No, I don't think I've played that one. 
So that is a super scalar style motorbike racing game. So it looks like Sega's, you know, system six, I guess 32 or whatever the, the super scalar hardware is. Mm-hmm. So it, it's kind of like a more advanced version of hang on visually. So it has like track elevation and some really lots of scenery on the side and it runs at a smooth 60 FPS. So it's a very fluid, fast, super scalar style game that is actually quite fun to play. That's pretty cool. I got a, um, my Jaguar, I've never had a Jaguar that worked right ever. Um, and this last one that I got, uh, I ended up sending to James from Retro HQ because he was curious why everything looked fine. Um, and he said he found a bug in, uh, he thinks it's a native bug in the Jaguar, just the Jaguar architecture of that revision motherboard. And he was able to change some code in the ROM cart to work around that bug. So I'll still have problems with original carts. Uh, usually I just have to power on the console five or six times for it to work. Um, but if I just use his ROM cart, it'll never, the game drive, I believe he calls it, um, I'll never have problems again. And I think that's en route to me coming back now. So I'll, I'm never taking that cart out of the cart slot. If it's working now, I'm no. just going to leave it and then just be happy with it forever. <laughs> Man, the Jag, it's uh it's such a weird system, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and it's um it's also yeah, I don't know. Looking looking again, have you heard of a game called Skyhammer? No. It's not a great game, but it's an interesting one. So it's from uh I guess the guys that did Alien vs. Predator. Mm-hmm. And this was a late generation game, and I think it 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 has a physical release but it released like late for the system. I don't know the exact year, but it was kind of after it was dead, Mm -hmm. but also before we got into like the modern kind of, you know, new games and such that this was a game designed for the Jaguar in its heyday. And it's basically like G police. So you're flying around like this big cyberpunk sort of looking city in 3d piloting this vehicle and just seeing that on the Jaguar with fully textured buildings and everything it's kind of insane that it actually works. Like, <laughs> well, now I'm definitely adding that to my list when I get the Jag back. I really want to try that one. So, oh man, I mean, Doom is good on the Jag. There's the Jag Link. You can play with it. I mean, that's just, that's a bit silly. I mean, have you actually looked in the manual for Doom? No. So if you get the Jag Link, it's like allows you to network your Jaguar, right? Right. But I think when Doom shipped, that hadn't that thing hadn't yet shipped. So they implemented support for it prior to release and so the problem was when you play with it it often disconnects and you get errors and it boots you back to the main menu and then you have to reconnect it's very annoying yeah but the manual describes this behavior as i kid you not demons getting into the system and interrupting the high bandwidth gameplay Ugh. so they try to explain it away as like demons from hell getting into your juggling what a cop like- out <laughs> I would have rather just had them not implement that at all. Yeah, pretty much. There was a there were a couple things like that that seemed so awesome at the time. Do you remember the game Zero Tolerance for Genesis? Oh yeah. So they had <laughs> yeah, the yeah. cables so you could plug two together and battle against each other. That's that's crazy, isn't it? It is. Have you ever actually tried <laughs> that though? With zero tolerance? Yeah. No. So I, I remember sending away, you had to, I think it was five bucks and I, you know, you had to mail it, mail a check for five dollars or something. And I, I think I got the, the link cable back like six months later or something like that. Um, and I don't think I ever, I think I maybe tried it once. And then it was only later on after I started retro RGB that we took a Sega Nomad, we built a link cable and we played it that way. And it was amazingly terrible. Like it was, it's not an experience that anybody today would sit down and enjoy, but I I almost wish it was something I could have tried out as a kid on the Genesis with, you know, a couple of friends or something. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That kind of thing. Link cables in general are actually something I kind of feel like I missed out on. Mm. Although, I mean, I got to play on the PC, so perhaps not. True. It's the same thing, but you know, in recent years I have gone back to use link cables, especially on things like PlayStation. Mm -hmm where playing like networked doom like playstation doom that actually works really well uh, there's various other games that support it as well i think actually one of my favorite things to do and i actually did do this back in the day with a friend was time crisis 2 on playstation 2 using the firewire connector link to another system so we'd have two systems two crts side by side and you're playing time crisis 2 at home that's funny and it's like it was awesome multiplayer 
uh, action. So I like that. <laughs> the uh, I, I did that with the Xbox because for a while, um, right when I uh, about when the Xbox came out, I was living with a buddy uh, in a house kind of by the ocean. So it was pretty neat. It was like a you know a early twenties kids party house type of thing, and we both had an original Xbox, and we occasionally would just play you know all the first person shooter games that way, and that was the the most experience I had with that. And prior to that was just the Game Boy Link cable. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny how we've got onto this topic while talking about the Jaguar, and I think that says a lot about the Jag. Yeah, it's it's kind I of mean, a terrible system, but we're we're still always talking about it, so it's made an so impression. So fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does it does have ports of other games, like it has Flashback, which is great. Mm-hmm. It actually has a version of Another World, the 20th anniversary version, which turns out to be the best. Like, uh, I guess you could say, kind of period hardware version of the game if you will like the 20th anniversary or whatever edition showed up on like newer consoles like ps4 right Mm -hmm. but eric chaw he also had a a jaguar version created and that runs in 240p uh it has some changes and improvements to it but it's it's like you know it looks amazing i mean it's it's a 240p version of another world with the improvements of the enhanced version Hmm. So that's really, really cool. So the must plays for a Jag would be Rayman, Tempest. Uh, what was the, the motorcycle racing game again? Super Burnout. Super Burnout and Another World. And out of all of those games. And Flashback. And Flashback. <laughs> and out of all of those games, they're all also good ports are available on other consoles. Maybe not the best ports, arguably, but good ports, right? Yeah, I mean, the only the only uh, exception would be Super Burnout, which, okay. you know, doesn't... It's not, you know, it's, it alone is not worth the price of a Jag, but it is an exclusive to that system. And, you know, the the thing is, though, is there's plenty of other games on the system that are interesting and worth checking out. Mm-hmm. Like Alien vs. Predator is interesting. I don't think it holds up that well, but it's cool. Absolutely. Um, and there's, there's a ton of stuff, like very B-tier style games on the system that are fun to mess with. Just stay away from Trevor McFur. Oh, yeah. Uh, that thing is... I mean that that's a case where the game is so bad like I have to wonder if it hurt the chances of the Jaguar on the market. Right. Like when I actually played it it left me feeling almost ill <laughs> and I thought maybe I never want to talk about the Jaguar again and then I played something else and I was fine but I really I uh, Trevor McFur is the cheapest most garbage piece of thing I've ever played like it's worse than Checkered Flag though? Much much. Wow, you think so? Here's the thing. <laughs> Checkered flag runs like garbage, yeah. but it looks okay. You see what's there. It's just poorly implemented, right? Right. The thing about Trevor McFur is due to the way, I guess, the, the hardware compression on the system and everything, it looks like it's like these pre-rendered graphics with like visible JPEG artifacts. Not actually JPEGs, but you know what I mean. It right, looks yeah, like compression artifacts. Artifacts in, in the art. It's really visible compression artifacts. Uh, you have... A, these complex backgrounds that are a single parallax background layer, so there's no depth. Uh, there's no music. Like the ship, the ship sprites are just hideous, and it's got these kind of like pew pew kind of sound <laughs> effects. Like the whole thing feels like a CDI game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the perfect segue then to the next system, uh, the Philips CDI. As soon as I feel like if we say that three times in a row, you hell from wrestling with gaming will appear out of nowhere next to me and start lecturing me on how good Thunder in Paradise is. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know what? Thunder in Paradise is an interesting one to start with because it's not terrible. So... I mean, it is, but it's also interesting because it's, uh, you know, it's a light gun game. But unlike something like Mad Dog McCree or whatever, it's actually more like if you were to say translate the Time Crisis experience or Virtua Cop. Like it's mm-hmm. it's the 3D style shooter with FMV where you actually once you get past the awful boat introduction, the camera like moves around environments, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like they chain it together with FMV there, so you'll like pan over to a spot. Enemies pop up, you shoot them down, and then the camera smoothly moves to a next spot. And, you know, that those parts weren't interactive in Virtua Cop, right? So, right. Uh, in, in that sense, it's one of the, it's an FMV shooter that kind of works, and it doesn't feel as bad. Like, there, there's some FMV shooters where it just looks so cheap and it just feels awful. Oh, Ground Zero actually, Texas, that's definitely one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, especially on on Sega CD when they would try to use these really nasty like 
horribly grainy FMVs, and they would layer in very low quality sprites that didn't really match the FMV at all. Right. And when you do that, it just doesn't work. Where here, it's like, you know, it arrives at a spot, and then the 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 camera stops moving, and then you're dealing with enemies, and then it moves again. So the enemies feel like they're kind of part of the environment instead of just like sprites that kind of move around the world. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So how did you play Thunder in Paradise then? Because you could play it with a controller, which is terrible. It's like playing, you know, it's like playing any of those Sega CD shooters with a controller. I heard the mouse was good, and I heard mixed things about the light gun, which makes me think maybe people didn't have the right CRT for it. So how did you play it? Ah, uh, so that's interesting. So I've played it all all of these ways. Oh, okay. <laughs> because, you know, we, we've, we've done the whole thing. I've tried two different types of IR remotes. They're awful, unplayable. Yes. Don't use it. I've tried the gamepad. It's also terrible, but it's slightly more playable. Mm -hmm. uh, the mouse is the best way to do it, I'd say. But then there's the light gun. And this, the light gun, the light guns in general, they, they have this reputation. Oh, you can't use it on a flat panel TV, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a good reason for that, technically. Well, the CDI is different. I haven't actually tried it, but I believe that this does work on a flat panel screen because unlike those, it uses an IR receiver. Uh, like the Wii sensor bar, if you will. Right. Where it's like the, the I guess the, the gun itself is like an IR camera, and you have this thing that you place above your screen that emits uh, IR to signals to the gun, basically. So you calibrate like a Wiimote, and then you're actually basically using it like that. So it's a light gun that works like the Wiimote, basically. Huh. <laughs> so the reason it doesn't work well, I mean, if you've played like light gun style shooters on the Wii, the problem is, is you don't really get that perfect precision of pointing right at the screen, right? right. It feels like you're dragging a cursor around and that's what they do basically. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like you're using the mouse, but you're moving your hand with a gun in it. and it doesn't, it doesn't feel great. It's neat. And the cord is so long on that, on that light gun. I feel like you could like walk around an entire house one time <laughs> and still have some slack. It's the antithesis of the PC engine in that sense. That's funny. <laughs> you know, even though you just described how it doesn't work, now I really want to buy that game with the light gun and give it a try. <laughs> it's so weird, man. That freaking, man. Oh, that, yeah. That, that's a game on there. There's other, you know, if you want to play Mad Dog McCree, um, you can do that on CDI, I'm sure. <laughs> Same thing, though. The light gun tracks like a mouse. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I, I mean, I was probably 12, so cut me a break with for this one, but I remember when it, uh, the CDI was kind of an adult a package, like an, a, an adult gaming machine, I guess, and one of the games that they had talked about was Voyeur, and I just remember mm. like talking to my cousin, like, oh yeah. my God, porn on a video game system. You know, once again, 12 years old, cut me some slack, but uh, I think I, I spent maybe, maybe three minutes with that game when I finally got a CDI and it was beyond terrible. Have you ever actually played that one? Uh, yeah, I have a copy and it came for free with, with a bundle and it's actually the German version. So it's dubbed in German. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's something. I think he <laughs> it's something where if you have a CDI that's able to play burnt games, I would say do it just for the heck of it. But I don't know if I would recommend anybody go out and buy it for the experience. No, but so there are some there are some legitimately interesting releases on here. First of all, it receives some PC style games that are actually really well translated. Mm -hmm. Now I won't say that these all hold up, but. A good example is The Seventh Guest, right? Just about to like say that, yeah. The big CD-ROM game mm -hmm. of the era, right? And the CDI version is, while not as good as the PC version because the resolution is lower, you know, it's like 240p versus, you know, six. it was actually high res on the PC, which was cool. Right. But it's a very, very faithful version that looks and plays just fine. And it works really well with the remote. The IR remote is actually a great use for adventure style games like that. You know, moving a cursor around the screen. I have never once gotten an IR remote to work in any of the CDIs I've owned. And I've probably had five remotes and at least four CDIs, probably more than that over the years pass through me. And I've never once gotten them to work. Uh, somehow I have two and they both work fine. So. <laughs> and there's no setup, right? You just put batteries in. No, it, the CDI it just works. It. it just works. If it doesn't, you know, it, it the IR receiver... Uh, is I guess it's the receiver. Mm -hmm. 
is on the console itself. Yeah. All right. It's on that front panel. But I mean, there's like a million iterations of the CDI, right? <laughs> right. It's not. Uh, another one, though, there's Lost Eden mm-hmm. from Cryo Interactive. It's another PC style game of the era. It's a really good version of it. It plays great and that has an app. Like that game has probably the best soundtrack on CDI. Oh. Uh, if you listen to that music, it's from Stefan Pick. Uh, he did like Dune 2 and such. And he, he did a lot of great music back in the day. I think he lives on an island now, from what I understand. And he like, runs a bar or something. But <laughs> seriously, go, go listen to the Lost the Lost Eden soundtrack. I think you'd be stunned by not only how good it is, but also how fresh it sounds. Like it doesn't, it's, it's very unusual music. And it's not quite, there is, really isn't a lot of other examples of music that sounds like this. Hmm. You, it could show up in a modern game and I think it would still feel... Uh, it would work great. Now, do you need the keyboard for any of those games, or could you just use the... Nope, uh, no. Nope. Okay. Just the IR remote. And it's the same with um, another weird one. So this is one called The Lost Ride, mm-hmm. which was made by Lost Boys Games. And these are the guys that would go on to form Guerrilla Games, right? Oh, okay. So Killzone, Horizon Zero Dawn. They made a CDI game in, like, 1998. It came out very late. And what's interesting about this is, tell me if this is bizarre to you. It's a full motion video shooting game that's random dungeon based. Wow. I've definitely never played this one. So basically what it is, is it takes place on a, an abandoned amusement park, like ride and also like mine cart tracks. Basically it's all on these tracks, right? Mm-hmm. But they're able, they came up with two interesting techniques. One uh, it's almost like the old QuickTime VR where you're looking at a video of the track moving forward, but you can look around. So you can actually look around inside the video window, right? Mm-hmm. So it actually, it's like a 360 sphere. So it doesn't feel like you're just watching a video. You're watching a video that you can look around. So you actually see stuff in the environment. So when you're shooting enemies in there, you know, they can come from different directions. That's super cool. I mean, that changes the FMV a lot. But then secondly, they found a way to seamlessly link video clips together. So they I don't know how many they generated, but they would make tons of different clips and junctions and pieces that were all video based that but you could link them together dynamically and randomly, right? So there's actually a map in this game. You press a button, you pull up a map of the of the track system because there's all these junctions that pop up and you can actually look go left or right on the junction. And so you're actually navigating what is effectively an FMV maze while shooting creatures. Uh, you know, it's not amazing to play, but it's it's really kind of impressive that it exists. And it's one of the best uses I've ever seen of, like, FMV technology in a game. That's pretty cool. I'll, I'll obviously keep a list of all this stuff in the description somewhere so people could reference this. But that's now I'm adding that to my list as well as one to actually give a try. Definitely. Uh, along the same lines, um, Tetris, of course, right? CDI Tetris is kind of legendary for its very chill soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, I liked you know, it. Um, I bought it. I was, I think it's the only CDI game I own at the moment, and um, I, I, you know, I liked it. It's not a bad game, but for some reason, the if I'm going to play Tetris, it's going to be the original Game Boy, the original NES version, or then any of like the more modern versions. I don't, I don't know why. Oh, I, don't I like I, the middle version. I'm with you. Mm-hmm. It's not a great version of Tetris to play gameplay wise, but because of the progression through those different environments and the music. It is occasionally a fun one to pop in because it really has like a unique atmosphere, unlike any other version of Tetris. Right. Well, at least until like Tetris Effect, which was you know. Yeah. Uh, th- that that you know, so CDI Tetris was the first experience Tetris, if you will. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I like that. Um, dang. See the man. This. Oh, I know the Apprentice. The Apprentice. That's actually a legit good platforming game for the CDI. Huh. Okay. I I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on that one. I thought I'd played a giant chunk of the CDI's library, but you know, you're naming a couple I never stumbled across. So the Apprentice, you play as like a wizard, and it's a vertical platformer. That's like a puzzle platformer that scrolls vertically. And there's first of all, it actually scrolls at a full fifty or sixty frames per second whether you're power and TSC. So it's a, it's a smooth game on the CDI, which is so unusual. It's a, it's almost hard to overstate how impressive <laughs> that is. It's got big sprites. It's very colorful. The scrolling is smooth. 
Uh, but the level design, the control, everything about it, it's a genuinely fun game. And it's, I think it's probably the best actual video game on the entire CDI. Uh, and it's not even close. It's, you know, it, it's a very B tier platformer on another system, mind you. But and is that released on any other platform? No, I don't think so. I think it's a CDI exclusive. It's from like the Vision Factory, hmm. which did a ton of CDI games. Um, some some good, some bad, but they were very prevalent on there. And The Apprentice is definitely one of the most impressive on there. All right. Well, now I definitely have another one to add to the list to give a try. So, yeah, the CDI, man. It's, I'm looking at the list again. Uh, I mean... I don't think it plays great, but Burn Cycle is interesting. It's got a cool aesthetic, a good soundtrack, and it's it's kind of a neat attempt to push the FMV genre forward in some different ways. So it's kind of one that is fun to experience just because of that. Right. I need to check if that supports the mouse. I feel like it would be a lot more fun if you could play it with the mouse. Yeah, absolutely. It should support it, actually. I, I bet it does. I need to try that. Uh, the thing that cracks me up about some of your videos is that you prop up your PVM with a CDI. You have a Philips CDI holding up your PVM. <laughs> yeah. So the re I did that. It just kind of struck me at this point. So the main reason I did it is because I wanted to bring the PVM up to eye level, right? Mm -hmm. The goal was to get it to eye level. So I'm not looking down at the screen. Right. You know what I mean? Like I just wanted to, for ergonomics. And then it just, I realized, wait, the, the feet on the PVM fit perfectly on top of the CDI. Uh, it's one of the, it's like the two, I forget which one it is, model, no, I think it's a 220. Mm -hmm. So the actual, the color of the of the material that it's made from is exactly the same as a PVM. Yep. It is spot on the same color. So when you take those two together and the fact that the whole, the case is like solid aluminum and such, right? It's right. like a metal machine. It's like an old VCR or a laser disc player. It's hefty. Uh, so it supports the weight just fine. But somehow it actually looks like an extension of the PVM in a weird way. So I just kind of left it there for that reason. Yeah, to the point that even though I've owned a couple of those CDI 220s, the first few times I saw it, it didn't even register in my brain that that's what it was because it looked like it fit so perfectly. And then I went, oh, crap, that's a CDI. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And, you know, it's the C The thing is beyond that, you know, the CDI itself is huge, right? right? These models. So, like, it doesn't fit anywhere else in the retro rack. So I was like, this serves so many purposes. It brings it up to eye level. Uh, it matches the PVM and it lets me keep a CDI hooked up so I can play Thunder in Paradise. <laughs> that is absolutely awesome. I have the top loading ones now. I actually have a PAL and an NTSC and only one of them has a working CD-ROM drive. So I'm kind of still working through that. But, uh, um, but 450. Yeah, but I bought that specifically because of size. Uh, and I also want to try out the RGB mod that people had discovered for it just because. But I think those FMV games... You know, I think a lot of people always misunderstand what I say about composite and RGB and, and take it out of context, but FMV games in composite video on a CRT, I think is the best way to experience it. Not on a flat panel. I think that just composite on a flat panel, especially direct in always looks terrible. Yeah. But I, I do think that composite on a CRT for stuff like that is kind of, I don't want to say it's better but it might be an easier way to experience that because it kind of smooths out some of that, you know, sharp pixelated look. A little bit, yeah. I mean, on on the 220 I have, I just went with a PAL unit that has the native RGB output on it as well as S-Video. Right. Uh, so I do use that actually. And I've discovered that a huge chunk of the CDI library was like developed in Europe anyway. Hmm. So everything seems to be PAL optimized. So using 50 hertz on there is no big deal because that's just... uh the games work fine at 50 Hertz and it had a lot of late releases on the CDI in Europe that I don't think shipped in America. Maybe I need to check on that, but either way, it's one of the few, it's like, it's actually the only system I use that I run at 50 Hertz and it's totally fine huh. for that. Now I'm, I think I'm correct about this. My buddy, Chris from Belgium always has to correct me, but I think that they're all, uh, the games are not region locked but they play at the speed of the region console that you're using. Yeah, I really want to check that, actually, because, um, you know, when I compare it to 60 hertz footage, it doesn't seem like anything's broken, right. right? Like, everything seems to run correctly, the timing's right, 
it seems like they're adjusting the speed somehow based on the unit you're using, which is pretty forward thinking for the time. And I, you know, again, I need to double check all this to be sure. I don't actually have a 60 Hertz unit here. It's just based on what I've seen on video clips. So, right. Uh, it does seem to work fine. And in fact, you know, video that's filmed at like 24 FPS is often bumped up to like 25 Hertz. Mm -hmm. So it's a, maybe a little bit faster. I don't know if they do this in the CDI, but you actually end up with like smooth, uh, judder free movies as a result hmm. <laughs> in PAL mode on some, like on DVDs and such, which is really interesting. Yeah. Normally this is the part of the conversation where I'd go, oh, no problem. Let me send you an NTSC version. But I think shipping would be hundreds of dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not a wise move to do with the CDI. <laughs> CDI likes to stay where the CDI stays. Yeah, absolutely. But if I ever stumble Except across for that a portable unit. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. If you have a if you have a spare 450, then that might work because those are uh, reasonably small. Right. <laughs> so I guess the uh, the next console would be 3DO, right? Oh yeah. Let me pull up my list here. So uh, for 3DO. the conversation you and I were just having the other day, I was I still think about it now and then because I still don't know what it is that I'm I'm experiencing but i played road rash on the saturn road rash on the 3do and then road rash on the playstation and the saturn version looked the worst it didn't play bad it just you know and it didn't look bad just compared to the other two it was the lowest um the playstation looked the best but for some reason mm -hmm. for me i felt like the 3do version felt smoother even with that crappy controller do you have any thoughts on that? On, you know, uh, I mean, smoother. That's a weird one to say because the PlayStation version runs at like pretty much double the frame rate. So yeah, the three D O version runs a lot slower. Like it's choppier. But I, I know what you mean. It's maybe similar to Need for Speed, where there's something different about the gameplay speed. I did a comparison before, but I can't remember exactly how it lines up in terms of like actual gameplay speed. Uh, so it might be slightly more playable on 3DO if it's too fast on the other systems, maybe. Could be. Could it be the way the input is processed? Could it be um, uh, inherent input latency in the way the consoles process the controllers? That seems very unlikely. I can't imagine the 3DO being especially quick in terms of input anyway. I would have so. to agree. I just, for whatever reason, whenever I press left and right in the game just to steer the motorcycle, it just feels like it steers. Hmm. I, I don't know if smoother was the right way, but you know, maybe I should just sit down again. I spent like, I, I've completed three or four races on each because I was just so curious. I spent like an hour with this thing and I don't know why. That's a really good one, though. But yeah, I love Road Rash on 3DO. It's a really nice place to play the game. It feels suitably 90s. I think my only complaint with it is the thing that would complete the 90s feel is if the licensed soundtrack could play during the gameplay. Yeah, I don't understand that. So I've wondered about that um, because the Sega CD version has the licensed soundtrack from the 3DO game that plays during gameplay as Redbook Audio. Right. I think... My guess is that at the time they hadn't figured out a way to, because they're streaming in graphics data in real time from the drive mm -hmm. while you play, right? So it's using the CD ROM drive during gameplay. So maybe they didn't have a way to stream digital audio. Like it doesn't need to be red book audio, but maybe they didn't have some sort of digital audio compression that they could both read in real time off the disc while also streaming game assets off the disc. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. That's certainly possible. Like that's my best guess as to why they did it that way, where they just like, well, we can't do both. So hmm. uh, they went with sort of a synthesized music track system instead. And you know, it is what it is, but that's a shame. But other than that, it's a good version. Need for speeds also great on the 3DO. Hmm. Um, in fact, Electronic Arts was huge on 3DO, obviously, right. since Trip Hawkins, you know, who founded 3DO, also founded Electronic Arts, you know, he kind of got them up to uh, where they were at the time, and then he went off to do 3DO, so they had support. They had really impressive versions of Madden and FIFA at the time, like not necessarily the games you want to play now, but when you go back and look at them and you consider the year they came out, it's kind of like... Like, whoa, look at what they were doing back then. Like, it was like a gateway to the future in some ways. I absolutely remember seeing the demo unit in FYE for your entertainment. Anybody on the East Coast probably remembers those. Oh, but, yeah. Um, I re definitely remember walking in and seeing a bunch of those games like, you know, Road Rash and the Madden games and just thinking, wow, this looks, this is a step above what we have now for Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo at the time. 
Oh, there it is. I was looking up another one from EA called Immersionary. Have you played that? No. It's a weird first person open world game that takes place in a like a weird version of virtual reality. Uh and it mixes FMV with comic book stuff, and then you're kind of in this first person world, and it's weirdly ambitious for the time. Like being able to explore a massive open environment in 3D uh from the first person like that. It's very strange, not that easy to play, but it's cool, so it's worth checking out. Mm-hmm. So, um, let me check. Let me see what else I got here. Uh, I really like uh, re- the Return Fire games. So, there's Return Fire, and then there's Maps O Death, which I managed to get a brand new copy of here in Germany somehow, like the, the US version. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's a shop near me, a retro shop, that for whatever reason, every time I go, they have like a shelf full of shrink-wrapped American 3DO games. So, of course, I'm buying those up. Uh, I, I don't know why they have those. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me, but they do, so... Why not? <laughs> Somebody moved over there and then dumped their collection out or something. Who knows? So, there's that. Um... So Return Fire is like the the capture the flag game mm-hmm. with uh ve- like war vehicles, so helicopters, jeeps, tanks, and it's it's a really fun little game where you're sort of traversing these islands and these vehicles, blowing up buildings, taking out defenses to basically make a path to get to the enemy's flag, and then once you've done that, you pull out the jeep and you drive over there, get the flag, and try to get back to your base. Hmm. And all of this is uh, complemented with classic. Uh, orchestral music that was used is i guess it's uh you know license free stuff obviously like you know but it's like like they have like for instance when you get in the jeep you have flight of the bumblebee play <laughs> which is perfect <laughs> right for that you have this little jeep you know what i mean it's like so they really did a great job of creating this it's both it's fun and funny and it just really works well so i'm a big fan of that is that an exclusive? I don't think I've heard of that on another console. No, no, no. That that uh, also exists on PlayStation and the PC. PlayStation version runs better, obviously PC as well. Uh, but I think I don't know if Maps O Death, the which is the add-on pack, was was implemented in the PS1 version or not. Though I actually don't know that for sure. Hmm. But for a while it was. It was initially exclusive to the 3DO. It was a kind of a system seller on there. Um, one of the one of the conversations I always to kind of jokingly argue about with my friends are is there anything on the cdo at all or cdo wow i'm, I'm mixing up my junky <laughs> consoles here anything on the 3do at all that's not better on another console so for whatever my weirdness with road rash aside you know the playstation version looks much better 60 frames per second so let's just call it on that but is there like gex i believe is 30 frames per second on the 3do but 60 on the playstation yeah. and you know is there yeah. anything actually on the 3do uh, in a, with that the supreme warriors like the the exclusive fighting game that some people tend to love so that's about it oh uh, supreme warriors the fmv fighting game that was also on like sega cd and such so any of those no, fmv yeah, games you're right from that not era, supreme warrior but you're thinking of way of the warrior way of the from warrior. naughty dog yes yeah which is uh phenomenally cheesy yes but um <laughs> still better than supreme warrior though so it's it's a tricky thing to look at and so first of all all the fmv games from that era tend to be best on 3do so there's that but not that important right um and then there's stuff like super street fighter 2 on there yeah it's like 2x i think right so when you consider the time when that game was released it's oh this was really impressive it's kind of the best home version right absolutely it's better than the 16-bit consoles it's not arcade quality but it's not that far off either. And it was full screen instead of like the sort of letterboxed image of the Super NES and Sega Genesis versions, right? right. So at the time, it was really competitive. There's also stuff like Stellar 7, mm-hmm. Draxon's Revenge, which I guess Stellar 7 was on PC, it was on Sega CD, it was kind of around, and the 3DO version kind of looks the best. Mm-hmm. And it's a really nice version of that. So I guess technically it's probably best on there. Um, let me think here. Starfighter from Studio 3DO, which is kind of amazing that this exists. I think I've also played it on Saturn, and I think the 3DO version actually looks better, which is a, that's a perfect example of this. Okay. Uh, but that's a game where you pl- it's a 3D polygonal space shooter, but you fly on planets. But what makes it so like insane is that 
and I think it's the first game I've ever played where you could do this. You're flying along a 3D planet on the surface through cities, but if you just fly straight up into the sky, it's not just a 2D bitmap. You fly up through the clouds, you leave the atmosphere, and you go out to space. And then you flip your vehicle around, and you actually see the planet you came off of. Hmm. Right? So you actually can fly from planet surface out to space and then back down. That's pretty uh, crazy. Which is insane. Like, I, I can't believe that they actually implemented that all the way back in the mid-90s in that way. Uh, it's super impressive when you think about it. And it, it was best in 3DO. I think out of all the games we talked about, I think that's going to be the first one I try later on today just to see. Yeah, you got to check out Starfighter. It's pretty impressive. Uh, also, there's stuff like Killing Time, which... So Killing Time runs at a really bad frame rate on 3DO, mm -hmm. and it, but it also got a, a PC version. But the PC version is almost like a pseudo-sequel. Mm -hmm. It's the same name. PC version runs better, but they went with a cartoony style. It doesn't quite feel right, where the 3DO version was like FMV-based sprites. And it actually had FMV sequences embedded into the 3D engine. Mm. And it's like a very creepy horror kind of experience. So in some ways, you could argue that's better on 3DO. Okay. I think... I feel like I've played that Mega, game before. Mega Race. Mega Race. You remember Mega Race with Lance Boyle? Right. <laughs> right. Is that an exclusive, though? Wasn't that also on... Um... No, no, no. That was on PC. Right. It was on Sega CD. It was around. And I think the 3DO version is the best. It has the highest quality music, the highest quality visuals... Uh, they actually added like special visual effects to the 3DO version specifically. You know, it's still, you know, it's an FMV based racing game. You actually control real, like, these cars are sprites, so they work. It's just the track is visually FMV, but it works surprisingly well. Huh. That's pretty neat. I, it's, it's so interesting to me that for some of these so called failed consoles, um, we're still talking about stuff that is actually genuinely worth playing on them. I, I don't know if any of these, I would say, go out and buy one of these consoles and then go through all the trouble you need to, to get them working just for them. But if you already own them, th I think I think it's pretty neat to, uh, to consider that there's still some must plays on it, if you will. Yeah, especially I think of, of the ones we've talked about, the 3DO, I mean, the 32X I have a soft spot for, but the 3DO is probably the best of them all. Mm hmm has the most stuff on it in a very interesting library and a huge selection of games. And I mean, it's even got stuff like uh, police knots from Hideo Kojima on there. Does it? It's got, you know, yeah, yeah, it does. Huh. Uh, it actually did rather well in Japan. So there's some Japanese exclusive games that you can pick up. Crystal dynamics was big on there. Crash and burn isn't too bad. Mm -hmm. There's a port of samurai showdown on there, right? It runs at half frame rate, unfortunately, <laughs> but it looks more like the Neo Geo game as opposed to the 16-bit ports. Right. So it's like you lose some performance, but you gain visual quality that brings it up. It has the full scaling where it zooms in and out, and the Neo Geo sprites and backgrounds. So it's a, it's like a weird compromise version, but you know, you could argue that it was an impressive uh, home conversion. I was going to say something about cost, but then I remember the 3DO was like 700 bucks at launch, so I guess it's kind of a Neo Geo territory anyway. Right, exactly. Uh. <laughs> did you know anybody growing up that had a Neo Geo or a 3DO? I did know someone with a 3DO, yes, but I don't. I did not know anybody with a Neo Geo. I didn't know. I knew one person in middle school with a Neo Geo, and then that was it. Not either of those consoles. Uh, I, I, for whatever reason, too. And for a while, when I, I lived with a family member for like a year or so, it was in kind of a more affluent town. So you would think that there was going to be a lot of that. But I don't think, I think most people I knew back then stuck to whatever the mainstream was Genesis, Super Nintendo, PlayStation. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I mean, that's, those are kind of the main failed consoles of that era, right? And I think, you know, it's fun to talk about them. I always like going back to these systems and finding more stuff, you know, digging deep and trying to understand like what was going through the developers heads at the time. Why trip Hawkins <laughs> uh, thought this was the future uh, in the 3do case, the CDI stuff is just madness. I mean, the CDI infomercials, yeah, uh, they blow my mind. Like the, what Phillips was doing back then. It just, it's, it's insane. Uh, didn't really work. Obviously, I mean, most of these were built on bad ideas, right? Right. <laughs> right. Bad ideas that, you know, you start to wonder how they got so far 
You know what I mean? Like, at, at what point, or how out of touch were the people in charge in those companies to think that those ideas were were going to work? Like, you could go to any mall in 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 the world at that point and just talk to kids and ask their opinion, and all of them would go, "No, that's silly. Why would you do that?" <laughs> I mean, that, that 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 ties right into the thinking about the FMV craze, right? Mm-hmm. Like, everybody thought FMV was the next big thing, so everybody was like building consoles around FMV. Except for Atari, of course. But, you know, it was all these attempts to get in on the ground level on new stuff. 3D, FMV, like new technologies, stuff that, you know, was difficult to do on the 16-bit machines. But they all all came at it from the wrong direction. And they didn't really support what the 16-bit machines did well. So you had these really janky early 3D games. Right. Not so great. FMV games, but if you wanted to have traditional 2D style games, well, these systems actually were really bad at that too. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did have a Sega CD growing up. I think I mowed. You know, I lived in the in the ghetto for a while, so finding lawns to mow that alone was a challenge. But I, oh, I yeah. mowed a million of them and, and bought myself a Sega CD. And in the context of the time, like you could call it a failed console now, but oh our, yeah, our TVs back then, at least the ones my family had, were weren't good. A lot of, so they kind of the FMVs didn't look as bad as you would expect on something like that. No, see, I the the Sega CD is not a one I would throw into the failed console pile at all. Like it was not as successful as like you know the bigger things, but for an add-on during that period, it did remarkably well. And I think it actually has a really good library. There's a lot of games in the Mega CD, and there's a lot of really good games in the Mega CD. Agreed. Uh, more than you would expect. And some of them are Japan exclusive, unfortunately, and I've picked up some of those. But there's just some... Uh, it's it's a great machine with some really cool games on it. And uh, I think it's unf- it's unfairly tossed in with Jaguar, CDI, and 3DO, <laughs> when I think it's actually much, much better than all of them. I agree 100%. And when the, the Mega SD came out, um, I even though I'd, I'd had a Sega CD, and when I repurchased them all, when I started Retro RGB, I, I'd burnt you know, 50 discs just to try stuff out. There were a lot of games that I just kind of read a quick description of and went, eh. Whereas when I had the ROM cart for it now, and of course also when Mr. It's added easier. support, I, I was more willing to spend time on a game that I probably wouldn't have wasted the 10 minutes to burn a CD on and found even more games that I really liked and I really thought they did a great job on um, and, and yeah. stuff that's truly worth playing. So it's, you know, especially if you have a Mr., I think that's the easiest and cheapest way overall to experience experience it now probably yeah definitely try those games out yeah i mean um you know like one of the ones i discovered last year that i hadn't played before was the the sega cd version or mega cd port of night striker from taito yeah Mm -hmm. which i'm a big fan of that game it's like cyberpunk space harrier basically right Right, yeah Uh, obviously the the mega cd isn't as capable as that arcade hardware but uh, they were able to put sort of its techniques to really good use, and it's a surprisingly impressive version of that game. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have a an arranged Zuntata soundtrack, so you have both the arcade soundtrack and an arranged soundtrack that's just unbelievably good. So, and it even has like that's kind of that's an example of the Taito games, like Ninja Warriors, and that they're almost like a, they're almost like music CDs for the band for the Zuntata in-house, you know band Mm -hmm. more than the games themselves where it's like the back covers it's all about zuntata there's like a music video and like a story (laughs) related to them in there like all kinds of crazy stuff it's it's insane actually but it's it's a fun thing to add to an interesting arcade conversion agreed so yeah, and the the Mickey game was one that I, I never bothered with until I got the you know played the Mister and I was it's a very hard game, annoyingly hard I guess. I don't know if I would ever sit there and play it to completion, but it's very Cuphead esque in in the way it plays. Have you have you tried oh, that yeah. one? It starts out black and white, you know. Mickey Mania, yeah, yeah, that, that was impressed. That's, that's been that's an interesting one. That's a good game all around, and it showed up on different 16-bit consoles and Sega CD, and it even has a Europe-exclusive uh, PlayStation version with completely redrawn graphics that are really, really good. Wow, really? Uh, yeah. Now i got to try that version. <laughs> and somebody did a PAL conversion patch for it, too, so you can play it at 60 hertz. Oh, wow. So there's a 60 hertz version out there, so it's worth checking out. But yeah, I mean, quickly to run down some of the awesome games I have, you know, stuff like... Uh, Snatcher is amazing, of course. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, let's see here. 
I liked Rise of the Dragon a lot as a kid. I haven't had time to yeah, revisit Rise it, the, but I'd like Rise to try of the that Dragon again. is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Earthworm Jim Special Edition. It's the best version of Earthworm Jim. Yep. It's really, really good. Uh, Echo the Dolphin 1 and 2 on CD. Oh, absolutely. Amazing soundtracks. Really great version to play. Pitfall the Mayan Adventure, also the best version. Mm-hmm. <laughs> again, <laughs> uh, I think Sylphie is really cool on there. Yes. It's great soundtrack I'm a big fan on of that. that. Great soundtrack. Bari Arm, Android Assault. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wouldn't guess it from the name, but it's a gorgeous uh, horizontal shooter with tons of parallax, an absolutely amazing soundtrack, and it's completely exclusive to the Sega CD. Mm-hmm. So that's that. There's also Denning Aleste. Uh, which one is it called? It's, you know, there's like Musha, and then it's like the sequel to Musha. Right, okay. Uh, I forget what they called it in the US, though, but it's an Aleste game, right? Yeah. So. It's a shooter, uh, right? That's really good. Yeah, it's a good yeah. vertical shooter. There's Final Fight CD, which is a stunning port of the arcade game that absolutely crushes all the Super NES versions. <laughs> yep. And has an amazing arranged soundtrack. So that's good. Uh, there's Pop Full Mail, mm. which is an amazing little like action RPG platformer that's really fun. The two Lunar games on, on there, those are great. Yep. Uh there's Sonic CD, of course, which I'm a huge fan I of. I love that game. So many people I know say it's their least favorite classic Sonic game, and I still love it. I still play it every couple of years and enjoy it's, it. It's cool. It's a it's a cool game. Yeah, it's got issues, but it's still cool. And I mean, it's the same core design to stuff like Soul Star and AH3 Thunder Strike, which use like the sprite scaling and rotation effects to do like cool vehicle based games that were really impressive. Uh. I mean, I could just go on and on here, but the list of, the list of cool Mega CD games is surprisingly huge, and it's a it's an amazing system in the end, and it's it's a it's a really fun system from that time. It's the it's this it's the second best CD ROM game console of that era, with the PC Engine being the top, mainly because you know after a while everything shifted to cd on that system Mm -hmm. for the most part so all a lot of the best games on pc engine are just happen to be on cd because that kind of became the standard format for it so so i'm I'm far from an expert on pc engine stuff but i got the impression and please correct me if i'm wrong here but i got the impression that um nec approached the cd-rom format as a way to say Hey, we're going to make the same games, but we're going to add really awesome soundtracks and we're going to, we're, you know, we're going to capitalize on that. Whereas Sega spent a lot of time saying, how can we jam as many gimmicks as we can to try to sell the console with FMV? So you say that and you're right, but that's a Sega of, a, that's a Sega of America strategy. Right. If you look at right. the Japanese mega CD, you see that Sega took a similar approach as NEC. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the Japanese developed games are the ones you want to look for because those are the ones that were built around they're like classic 16 bit style games with some slight visual enhancements and audio enhancements that you would expect from the CD format. It's just a lot of the Western FMV stuff. And I think that actually is what gives Sega CD a bad name because people think about these grainy FMV games, right? But in reality, it only makes up a small percentage of the overall library. And even though those, those were the ones that everybody was talking about at the time, they're actually like the worst things in the system yeah. and it kind of overshadows all the great games that are, are available on the Sega CD. So uh, in that sense, you know, ig- ignore the FMV unless you like have like nostalgia for it mm-hmm. and look, look elsewhere. Cause there's good stuff there. You know, uh, one thing when, uh, when my brother came home, he lives out in LA and I'm in New York. Uh, when he came to visit a couple months ago, we sat down and watched uh, somebody had cut together footage of the latest release of Night Trap to make like a Night Trap movie out of it. Oh, and I cool. had more enjoyment watching that than I did replaying the game again when I got it a few years ago on the with the limited run re-release. And it's, oh, it's just, yeah. uh, I find a lot of those things. Uh, I've, another channel I'm a giant fan of is Pushing Up Roses. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, I, it's just my opinion, of course, but a lot of the games that she talks about, especially the King's Quest series that I grew up playing, I have way more fun watching her talk about those games and, and put the visuals out there than I do <laughs> actually going back and playing yeah, some of those. So I can understand that for sure. Anybody that wants to really have a, an experience of a full motion video game might want to just uh, check YouTube for some of these, you know, cut movie-esque, for, you know, versions exactly, of them. Exactly, exactly. 
So thank you so much for taking the time to sit here with me. Uh, you know, it's a lot of times I end up messaging you and, you know, unbothering you to answer some of these questions. <laughs> and I thought it was a lot of fun to do it in a way where everybody else could enjoy the answers as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, of course. It's always a pleasure. I have fun chatting about this stuff, especially for consoles. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, you could find John everywhere at Dark One X. And uh, I am at the moment just retro RGB everywhere. And uh, please check out Digital Foundry's channel and all of the DF Retro stuff. Uh, I'm a giant fan of it. If you're watching this, you probably are already subscribed, but uh, definitely wanted to give a shout out to them. And a uh, thank you very much to John.